he was committed, he was paternalistic, as most colonial people were, in authority, but he was the kind of guy who believed that if you want to get something out of your workers, you want to get them on your side, you have to make some changes. Hi there, Carl Brown here with you. Come with me on my YouTube channel. Yes, let's go into my time tunnel and see what's behind there for you. Hi there, Carl here with you. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. And today let's look at something political, historical, interesting and educational. Yes, we're looking at Chetty Jagan at 100 The Legacy, a discussion that took place some time ago and I found it very, very interesting. I did meet him a few times, a pleasant personality he was. Chetty Barrett Jagan was a Guyanese politician, founder of the PP, who was first elected Chief Minister in 1953 and later Premier of British Guyana from 1961 to 1964, prior to independence. He later served as president of Guyana from 1992 to 1997. He is widely regarded in Guyana as the father of the nation. Now, talking about his life and people who've really worked along with him and knew him to that extent, one of them, they, first of all, there is Professor Clem C. Turan, and then there is Eric Huntley. First, I'll introduce you to Clem C. Turan, and he will really bring home what, how much he knew about Dr. Jagan. A bit about Professor Clem C. Turan. He is a writer, historian of the Indo-Caribbean experience and of West Indies cricket. He was born in Guyana and has been based in England since 1986. C. Turan grew up in East Babis, Quarantine and attended the Shitanka Anglican School, the Burmese Educational Institute and Queen's College in Guyana. He studied at Manchester University in Canada and taught Caribbean studies at the University of Guyana before completing his doctorate in history at the University of Warwick in 1990. He joined the staff of the University of North London where he was head of Caribbean studies and was awarded a professorship in 2002. He's Guyana's best historian and is currently editing a book of his writings on Dr. Chetty Jagan. I now present to you Professor Clem C. Turan, B-A-M-A, Ph.D., D-L-I-T-T, -T, about the life of Dr. Jagger. Now, people who try to t write and talk about Chetty Jagger start from Port Morant, where he was born on the 22nd of March, 1918 and usually go through with the old narrative about the exploitative character of the plantation and how oppressive it was and so on. Um, but look, not all plantations were alike. There were plantations where there was qualitative difference and where different management and different management styles made a difference. Port Morant was one of those places because it was not a book of plantations or it was not a Sandbach Parker plantation, or it was not a Curtis Campbell plantation. It wasn't owned by any of these big companies. Port Morant was owned by two Anglo-Indian brothers. And therefore, the managers there had a greater degree of autonomy, a greater degree of freedom, because they only owned one plantation. As a result of that, um, and because of the fact that the manager was a man named J.C. Gibson, who was manager there from about 1908 right on to about just before the war, 1938. <clears throat> he was committed, he was paternalistic, as most colonial people were in authority, but he was the kind of guy who believed that if you want to get something out of your workers, you want to get them on your side, you have to make some changes. And there was considerable reforms, because there was one of the first places of Port Peron where they start to get rid of some of these logies and to allow people to build houses and so on. And to use the irrigation water they got on the Kanji Creek to give people to grow rice. Not too much to make them independent, but enough to give them a degree of comfort while still being employed on the plantation. Take giving them a, a locomotive to go into the back dam and so on. All of these things. So what I'm saying here, and Jenny's father himself was a, what I used to call a drive on the plantation. So he wasn't the lowest of the low, 
there was already a degree of mobility there. And I think that um, that made a great impact on him, that he was already advancing, but he was also very conscious of how far you had to go. Now, people have always asked, when did he become a communist? Did he become a communist in the United States? No, he did not. He met Janet Jagan um, in around 1942 or 43. They got married in 43. But she was a member of the Young Communist League. He was not. He was very interested in the black struggle there. He was greatly influenced by the Indian nationalist struggle and so on. Um, but it wasn't until he got back to Guyana that he really became um, a communist. And he recalled for V.S. Naipaul in 1991 um, how this process happened. I just want to read this very briefly. Can you recall for V.S. Naipaul in 1991 his discovery of enchantment with Marxism-Leninism? It was Janet, who when she came here in 1943, brought me little Lenin library books. It was then for the first time I read Marxist literature. I got more to read, which we could do later on. But what I'm saying is that uh, we have to uh, recognize that he came to Marxism not in the United States, though indirectly through Janet Jagger. Now, <clears throat> this is where, you know, Shetty made a great impact on me. I can talk about his personal experiences and so on. But we went, I don't want to be too pretentious here, I went in a different way later on because I couldn't support the pro-Moscow orientation that Jerry Cho took. And I think one of the reasons for this was that he was greatly influenced, which I'm dealing with in this book, by a man named Billy Strachan. Some of you know him here. Um, and he was a powerful, a, a, a great uh, figure in the, the Caribbean Labour Congress. He was also affiliated to the Communist Party of Great Britain. And for nearly 50 years, Jerry and Janet corresponded with them. There was hardly anything they did in British Guyana or in Guyana without primarily British Guyana didn't correspond with them. They didn't communicate with Billy Strachan. Now, I think this was the problem, because MI5 was constantly intercepting the letters as well as the phone calls. Uh, that was, I would say, the principal reason why the Constitution was suspended in 1953, trying to telescope all of this. Um, but everything was virtually recorded. Everything was intercepted. MI5 was taping them every, every conversation they virtually had. So I think they were very much aware that um, Chetty in particular um, was very much a, a communist and that he was oriented towards the Soviet Union. Not oriented, that he was totally committed to the Soviet Union as the way forward, as the example forward for not only Guyana, but for places, other places around the world. And I think that um, the weakness of that position, of Chinese position there, was that the original PPP up to 1953 was a coalition of people from different political perspectives. And to try to impose that, or to be seen to be imposing that, meant that you were bound to have conflicts. And the other thing I want to say here is that Chetty was profoundly, understandably, profoundly shaped by the plantation and the narrative of the plantation and bookers as the sugar gods, uh, the plantation as this area of darkness and exploitation and so on. Now, this image, interestingly enough, had no resonance at all. No resonance at all or very little with the African people in Guyana who had long left the plantation and in spite of slavery, um, that message did not resonate with them at all. So his principal focus, although he had a broader working class perspective, his principal focus, the narrative of the plantation as um, bitter sugar and Booker as the the sugar gods, the exploited sugar gods, could not resonate with, um, with Africans at all. 
and that was a major shortcoming and um, it created immense problems. Um, of course, Burnham, who was very much a part of the early PPP, um, did not, was not a Marxist, did not subscribe to a communist perspective. He felt he was brighter than Jagan in any case. And the African people there were looking towards him because the momentum seemed to be going towards Indians. Uh, the Indians um, had been successful with the rice industry between the wars. You had an Indian middle class now that um, was becoming even prominent in Georgetown. Um, you had uh, Indian professionals a tremendous progress in education. So even the areas where Africans have been dominant in the <coughs> colonial civil service, in the teaching profession, law and medicine and so on, the Indians are now moving into that. And at the late, late 1940s, the eradication of malaria meant that the Indian population on these plantations jumped significantly. It's interesting, Port Morant was not an area of high malaria. So they were always fitter, in many ways much more dynamic and active. The level of lethargy in colonial Guyana was massive, substantial because of the malaria. And among Indians, probably worse, because they had less immunity to it. So from the late 1940s, not only did you have the eradication of malaria, but you had a significant in jump in the Indian population, and that was coincident, coincidental with the granting of universal adult suffrage where everybody had to vote. So the PPP, I will stop here because we'll go beyond this later on. The PPP was created precisely at a time when the momentum was with the Indians, not the African people. And that is why people like Barna would have been very defensive. People like UC Koyana, who was a Marxist like Chedi, but not a pro-Moscow communist, uh, felt that he should take more of a Marxist line rather than appear to be recognizing the importance of the Indian component of his support and so on. These are issues we will discuss later on. One final point here is that this PPP of 1953 that we tend to celebrate as some kind of golden age, it did not, wasn't really a golden age, it had golden potential. But the problem there was, it was a coalition not only among different ethnic groups, but people of different, diff different political perspectives, including some Indian nationalists and so on. And um, to be seen to be taking a pro-communist, pro-Moscow line, uh, which was precisely the position that Chedi and, and Janet took, our leaders of that particular school of thought, um, could not accommodate those divergent perspectives that resided in that so-called PVP of 1953. And that is why UC Koyana, Sidney King as he then was, had advised Burnham and Jagan not to contest all the seats in 1953. He said, I only want you. He said, when I told them, they said, we're going to win about eight. He said, well, you all should only contest about eight. And UC Koyana and Mike Martin, supported by Martin Carter, had brought it up in the General Council and introduced a motion in the General Council that should only contest eight seats in 1953 because they should not try to win because the party was not a united party. The ethnic problems were still a significant one. And if you try to win and go into power, you're going to screw up. So I think this is just a start to give you some perspective on a lot of things that we have taken for granted, but that's not necessarily so. It was a party that was already, it was not a party in the way we understand it, uh, or we've been made to understand it. There were many factions there, ethnic, religious, ideological, and so on. Thank you for listening. Sure, it was interesting. And I'll be following up that with um, another talk, but this time by Eric Huntley. So feel free to like, subscribe, give me your views and comments. And once again, it's a pleasure being with you. Thank you for watching. Catch you next time.